I have a fabulous team of experts here today. Uh, they all have a very high profile and more than that, they believe passionately uh, in the issues that surround gender and thrombosis. I'm going to introduce them one by one. I think many of you will know uh, them, but I, we're going to start uh, with 20 minutes talking from Professor Fianola Niani, and she's going to talk to us about gender, VT risk, uh, and the effect of treatment. So Fianola is a consultant hematologist in Dublin. She serves two hospitals, the Mater Misericordiae and the Rotunda Maternity Hospital. Uh, she's a clinical professor with a lot of research under her belt and treating patients day to day. Uh, her research uh, attributes uh, are recognized because she's director of the Irish Network for VT Research, uh, and she also co-directs the Sphere Research Group at the UHD Conway Institute. She's been a member of the World Thrombosis Day Steering Committee, uh, and really in Ireland, she has been campaigning to improve VTE care uh, and has been closely linked with VT Ireland, uh, the patient group, which she has profoundly supported. So Fianola, over to you. Thank you for thank, coming along. Thank you very much, President, for that beautiful introduction and huge thank you to uh, Jill and the entire team on organizing this phenomenal two weeks of um, multidisciplinary awareness raising and in particular for this afternoon's program. So it's my honor to speak about gender VTE risk and the effects of treatment. Here are my disclosures. So first I'll begin with some epidemiology and some sex specific differences around PE mortality and VTE recurrence risk. I'll then touch on VTE prevention and uh, risk assessment in pregnancy, followed by anticoagulation for VTE in women, specifically around the nuances of abnormal uterine bleeding. And I'm looking forward very much indeed to the phenomenal talks that will follow from my colleagues, uh, Professor Middledorf and Dr. Newsom. So to begin with sex specific differences, Many countries have reported an increasing instance of PE, as we all know, in recent decades, potentially due to more comorbidities, better diagnostic imaging, and of course, VTE awareness, as beautifully highlighted by Professor Hunt's work. In this excellent recent study by Dr. Stefano Barco and colleagues, um, including those on this um, call, PE-related mortality and time trends were assessed in the European Union along with gender differences. The authors looked at vital registration data from the WHO mortality database, covering the sub-regions of the WHO European region listed here, and observed a decrease in age standardized annual PE related mortality rates from 2000 to 2015. And really interestingly, PE-related mortality was shown to increase ex exponentially with age, as we might expect. But importantly, women had a higher PE-related mortality rate than men at two specific times between the ages of 15 and 29 years, likely reflecting the use of um, contraceptive agents, and after 80, whereas mortality was higher in men between the ages of 40 to 79. In the entire population, PE was reported as the primary cause of death in 7.5 cases per 1,000 deaths in women and 5.4 cases per 1,000 deaths in men. And the difference between the sexes was biggest in 15 to 55 year olds, as you can really clearly see here. As you can see, the overall age and sex specific differences were less evident in Eastern Europe. So collectively, these really powerful data demonstrate that, look, we're having a decreasing trend across sexes and across all EU subregions, but PE still remains a substantial contributor to total mortality, especially amongst women aged 15 to 55 years, highlighting the crucial importance of the work of Thrombosis UK, other national awareness raising organizations, and particularly the work of the World Thrombosis Day Committee, chaired by Professor uh, Beverly Hunt. 
In addition to mortality, another important gender specific epidemiological difference is VTE recurrence risk. And the recurrent VTE has consistently been reported to be higher in men than in women. One of the earliest studies to demonstrate this was this, you know, this really important phenomenon was this one published in the New England Journal in 2004. And you can see that VTE recurrence risk was more than three times more common in men than in women. Moving on then to the very specific area of VTE in pregnancy. So as I think everybody who has joined this call today and all of our speakers are fully aware, venous thromboembolism is particularly crucial in terms of a raising awareness in pregnancy because it is a leading cause of tragic maternal mortality and contributes to long-term consequences in women who experience VTE during pregnancy. VTE risk rises during pregnancy and is highest in the postpartum period. And there are many risk factors above that baseline risk for pregnancy associated VTE. And these can be broadly divided into those characteristics that are specific to the woman, specific to pregnancy, and importantly, those that arise during labor and delivery. And I'll talk about this more in some detail, but it's so important that we risk assess, that we look for every, all of these potential risk factors in every pregnant woman and repeat that risk assessment when the woman has delivered. And again, these risk factors are utilized by international guidelines and national guidelines, including the superb Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology guideline. Um, and this is a screenshot of it from the updated 37A guideline from 2015. And it's really important to risk assess because risk factors for VTE are very common in pregnancy and postpartum. In this cross-sectional study of prospectively collected data, we did over 20,000 postpartum electronic VTE risk assessments at the Rotunda Hospital Dublin, where I work with a phenomenal interdisciplinary team. And this project represented over 90% of all women giving birth in this single institution. We identified that VTE risk factors are very common and nearly one, nearly four in five had at least one VTE risk factor, including obesity and older age, that over two in five women had two or more VTE risk factors. And crucially, one fifth of women had no VTE risk factors prior to delivery, but developed them during delivery or the postpartum period highlighting the crucial importance of repeating a VTE risk assessment postpartum. And I go as far as to say that this is my most important take home message, risk assessment, risk assessment, risk assessment, and put systems in place to ensure that this happens. The burning question then is, well, if this risk is so high in some women, can we reduce this risk? The story is not as clear as we would like, a recent Cochrane review concluded that there was insufficient evidence on which to base recommendations for thromboprophylaxis during pregnancy and called for large scale, high quality randomized trials of currently used interventions, which of course everybody on this call knows is an incredibly challenging, um, you know, challenging thing to achieve. So at present, guidelines are mainly based on expert opinion rather than high quality evidence. And in particular, the threshold at which thromboprophylaxis is recommended varies widely. We must remember the competing risks of pharmacological thromboprophylaxis, including bleeding, um, injection site um, pain and itchiness and the cost. Because of the lack of high quality data, now can you see my slide there? No, they just disappeared. Okay, don't worry. It's, it's anyway. This this slide uh, shows that that what well, was intended to show that there is huge variation in how women with VTE risk factors would be managed according to international guidelines. And you can't see the slide, but basically it comes from our JTH paper in 2019, 
and shows that the proportion of women who would be recommended thromboprophylaxis varies um, from you know, a few percent to over 40 percent, depending on the guidelines that are used. And this further highlights the crucial need for high quality trials in this area. So for the risk factor that is a previous VTE, we of course know that the risk of VTE recurrence is particularly worrying in this patient cohort. And first such a woman who's had a previous venous thromboembolism, her risk changes a lot when she is pregnant. And we must of course plan for this. These women have a high recurrence risk during pregnancy and require special attention because VTE remains a leading cause of maternal death. Pregnant women who are at the highest risk are those with a history of either an unprovoked or a hormone provoked VTE. But it does seem that this risk is reduced with low molecular weight heparin. Previous guidelines have suggested various approaches to VTE prevention in these women, including a low prophylactic or an intermediate low molecular weight heparin dose. But unfortunately, until recently, no high quality data were available to determine the optimal dose of thromboprophylaxis. But that is about to change and huge um, hats off and um, congratulations to Professor Middledorp who led um, the most remarkable um, international team in this academic multi-center, multinational randomized trial termed the HILO study. And this study has, as you probably are aware, close to recruitment. Um, and is addressing this question. Um, its completion has been a remarkable achievement because conducting high quality trials in pregnancy is incredibly challenging. And the results will, for the very first time, provide high quality data to guide the optimal management of these very high risk women during pregnancy. So now returning to how we should manage women with higher risk, you know, with more, with stronger risk factors. And um, current guidelines, broadly speaking, suggest antepartum and postpartum thromboprophylaxis for women with unprovoked VTE, VTE provoked by estrogen and some stronger thrombophilias. And postpartum thromboprophylaxis only reflecting the higher risk of this period for women with VTE provoked by major transient non-hormonal provoking factors and some weaker thrombophilias. But what about other risk factors? It remains a huge area of uncertainty. And of course, these multiple common risk factors that we talked about earlier and that are highlighted in various guidelines, including the ORTHCOG guidelines, are incredibly common. And as an interim solution, individualized risk assessment and shared decision making is advocated. But again, there is some good news um, on the horizon, and that is the recent commencement of the pilot partum randomized control trial led by another incredibly um, impressive um, international colleague, Dr. Leslie Skeeth from the University of Calgary, who has um, engaged colleagues from all around the world to randomize women who are postpartum and have VTE risk factors to low dose aspirin versus placebo for six weeks. And these are women with a, with, who are postpartum with additional VTE risk factors that are carefully highlighted in the protocol. So we look forward very much to the outcome of the pilot and hopefully to a very successful full trial. So until then, we must at least risk assess every pregnant woman so that we are aware of risk factors and can implement our local guideline recommendations. We mentioned earlier how important it is to repeat a VTE risk assessment in the postpartum period. Is this feasible, though, in the very busy environment of the postnatal ward? Well, the good good news is that with good multidisciplinary collaboration, teamwork, and with positive um, collaborative, collaborative um, team building, it is, as demonstrated by the wonderful team in the Rotunda Hospital Dublin, led by my colleagues, Professor Jennifer Donnelly and Professor Brian Cleary. It's a huge congratulations to that team. And I have to give a shout out to all of our phenomenal midwifery colleagues, without whom this initiative would not be possible. I will not talk 
in great detail about hormone productivity because I'm looking forward tremendously to Dr. Newsom's talk. However, very briefly, we know that um, the risk, well, we suspect that the recurrence risk following an estrogen provoked venous thromboembolism um, may be different to that following an unprovoked VTE. And in this beautiful recent systematic review and meta-analysis by the group of Professor Middledorp, um, they evaluated recurrence following an estrogen provoked VTE and reported a pooled um, recurrence rate of 1.57 per 100 patient years, which of course is low compared with studies including people with, for example, unprovoked VTE. And of course, we do need more data. We need large prospective studies on VTE recurrence rates and risk factors after stopping short-term anticoagulants. Hmm. For women, with hormonal or pregnancy-related VTE, therefore, limited duration anticoagulation may be appropriate for most women with prior hormone or pregnancy-associated VTE, but importantly, after close follow-up and personalized assessment of risk factors. And this has been highlighted in the recent European Society of Cardiology guidelines on acute PE, and indeed in our recently published position paper. So the last part of my talk, which will be very brief, is around the area of anticoagulation for VTE, particularly in younger women and those with it, with, who have a uterus. And it's so important that this issue is addressed and discussed with every woman. So FIGO, or the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics, defines abnormal uterine bleeding as the overarching term to describe any departure from normal menstruation or from a normal menstrual cycle pattern. In VTE treatment, DOACs are as effective and cause less bleeding overall than vitamin K antagonists. However, despite a lower risk of bleeding, abnormal uterine bleeding is more commonly reported in association with factor 10A inhibitors than with vitamin K antagonist therapy. And I'll briefly go through some of these data. Heavy menstrual bleeding is the most common manifestation of abnormal uterine bleeding, affecting about one in five women during their childbearing years in the absence of anticoagulation. Heavy menstrual bleeding is defined as more than 80 mils of blood loss per menstrual cycle or as clinically excessive menstrual blood loss that disturbs the physical, emotional, social or material quality of life. And it is so often overlooked as an adverse effect of anticoagulation. Patients anticoagulated with DOACs for venous thromboembolism include a younger demographic compared to those, for example, receiving anticoagulation for stroke prevention. And they have so much to gain for the advantages of DOACs, but a lot to lose with reduced quality of life associated with you know, heavy menstrual bleeding, on the other hand. And some of the data that we have on this area come from post hoc analyses of randomized trials. And again, bleeding definitions and I suppose, um, you know, the, the, the definition of bleeding events um, for, for women who are menstruating, menstruating was not always um, perfectly done, but um, that is um, hopefully going to improve in the future. In this post hoc analysis of Einstein trials, um, the authors compared the incidences of recurrent venous thromboembolism and abnormal uterine bleeding in women aged less than 60 years who are on anticoagulation with rivaroxaban or VKA, and this was for VTE. And abnormal uterine bleeding occurred more frequently with rivaroxaban than with vitamin K antagonist therapy with a hazard ratio of 2.13, which was significant. Conversely, abnormal uterine bleeding risk does appear to be lower in women treated with dibigatran versus vitamin K antagonist therapy. And again, this was also a post hoc analysis of pooled recover and remedy studies. And the risk was 5.9% with dibigatran and 9.6% with, with warfarin, giving an odds ratio of 0.59, which was statistically significant. However, again, we need higher quality data. And there is again, hope on the horizon. Um, again, thanks to the phenomenal efforts of Professor Middledorp, who is leading the Medea study. This study will randomize, is randomizing women with heavy menstrual bleeding who are on a factor 10A inhibitor. And they are being randomized to a switch to dibicotran, continuation of the factor 10A inhibitor, 
or continuation of the factor 10A inhibitor with the addition of tranexamic acid. So we look forward in, enormously to the outcome of this really important trial. And in the meantime, we suggest that women who are on anticoagulation, who are of childbearing age, undergo a history and physical examination. Um, and if they have heavy menstrual bleeding, and they should be asked about this specifically, that we ask about the duration and frequency. Of course, check hemoglobin and iron and correct any iron deficiency, because this can really impact on quality of life. If they are warranted, gynecological review and radiological investigations should be uh, considered. And again, all we can do at the moment is um, consider um, various strategies for these women, none of which are proven, um, and ideally to recruit these women if it's open in your centre to a clinical trial. So in conclusion, there are, I hope I've convinced you, important gender specific considerations when we assess VTE recurrence risk and indeed PE mortality. We must risk assess every pregnant woman because otherwise we may miss opportunities to save lives and to avoid tragedy. And assessment of VTE recurrence risk during pregnancy should take into account these personalized risk factors. Finally, it's crucial that we ask every woman who is on anticoagulation about heavy menstrual bleeding and that we take steps to try to improve her quality of life. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions either now or at the end of the session. Well, that was marvellous, Fiona. You covered a huge amount of ground there very uh, clearly. Um, there is actually a question in the box. We do have time. Um, <laughs> So something's happened to my Zoom that I can't quite access it, but it was a question about mechanical thromboprophylaxis. Mm. Um, what do you think about mechanical thromboprophylaxis in pregnancy? Uh, they, uh, the writer points out that it's not recommended by GERFT, but maternity uh, units follow ARCOG where it is, uh, mm. and NICE, which I think is going to change its guidance. Yeah. So again, as, as with so many um, issues pertaining to uh, prevention of pregnancy, prevention of VT in pregnancy, we have, you know, very, very, very few data. And I know that the strategy varies from, you know, from country to country. So of course, it's important to follow your, your national recommendations. But my understanding is that there are two recommendations that are are at odds with each other at the moment. So is that right, Beverly, the ORCOG and NICE? Yes. So I suppose what we we've certainly moved away from um we've we we've moved away from root, routine use obviously of, of um, mechanical prophylaxis, but for women undergoing cesarean section, um the one thing we have changed in recent years in Ireland is that we no longer in our institution use thigh length stockings and these women are only given knee length stockings. But again, we, we have to highlight that we don't have high quality data to, to guide their use. What is your, um, what is your practice um, in your institution? We're, Hunt? we're about to use, remove stockings from every indication okay. for thromboprophylaxis because of the GAP study. Yeah, uh, showing there was no benefit uh, in surgical patients at moderate risk already on low molecular weight heparin. And then we've got the CLOP study suggesting that actually if you wear stockings and you've had a stroke, there is a potential for harm and you certainly don't reduce the rate of VTE. Uh, yeah. But I think if, if you remove stockings, you have to put something else in place. Yeah. And uh, we are trying to use intermittent pneumatic mm. compression in the very immobile patients, which of course isn't very common in obstetric care, mm. is it? Yeah, exactly. And it, but it is um, useful in very, very high risk women um, who have a temporary contraindication and where we don't have any other options. But it is there are there are um, pragmatic considerations and I know they are not always available easily in every institution so it, it, it is you know sometimes a, a, a resourcing um, dilemma but certainly not in our institution that's a, a great question and I uh, congratulations on the completion of the GAP study and its publication and delighted to hear that it's impacting on on guidelines and um, Professor Hunt that is 
really wonderful. Uh, well, it's not, it's Alan Davis is leading. And in mm -hmm. fact, there's funding now to look at stocking versus no stocking in low risk surgical patients. So okay. that trial will be getting going. And that's thousands uh, in the UK fairly yeah. soon. Fiona, do you want to comment on how difficult it is to do research mm -hmm. in pregnant ladies, especially with thromboprophylaxis? Because yeah. I feel it's a nightmare. I don't know if Saskia wants to join us. I, I think I should allow Saskia to answer this question because as I've said to her, I think both, you know, both, both of you deserve a Medal of Honour for what has well, been achieved and you know particularly in high low i i think saskia should answer that yeah so i think it's 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 quite challenging indeed but it's mm. not impossible and we've shown that so high low has recruited over uh, 1100 women uh, internationally but also the alive 2 trial which deals with thromophilia and recurrent miscarriage has uh, recruited over 300 patients and we have previously re recruited women pregnant with recurrent miscarriage, also over 300. So it's a lot of work. It takes you ten, a decade of your life with the current circumstances. But uh, at the end, we will prevail. So yes. a nightmare, I think it is not, but it's challenging. Yes. Uh, can, I, can I, yeah, can I, I add to that? Perseverant. <laughs> um. You know, I think not a nightmare, an absolute um, privilege, and it sometimes does feel like a social justice movement, doesn't it? Because these women deserve um, high quality data. And your last question is on the risk of VTE with TXA uh, if yeah, used for menorrhagia. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to take that, Saskia? I'm very happy to comment, but because it's specifically for the Medea trial, again, we've we've um, no high quality data. I'm aware that we have that um, risk highlighted in um, the you know in in the product information leaflets for these agents, but again, can be incredibly useful and improves quality of life for women who have abnormal uterine bleeding and as the question and um, as as Dr Main has pointed out it is um one of the one of the three arms of the Medea trial led by Professor Middledorp so hopefully you know fairly soon we will have data um, and we will be able to address um, thrombotic signals or not and of course Thanks to everybody on this on this call, we do have many trials involving tens of thousands of women, obviously in slightly different circumstances, without a thrombotic signal, um, and the only one in which we've seen a, a, any signal is the HALTA trial. Do you want to comment further, Saskia, given that you're the lead of the Medea trial? No, I think that Beverly wants to comment that there is absolutely zero. Um, is it Absolutely zero if you use it as a one off, but there is Danish retrospective data saying that uh, in they, they did a, a very large study and they looked at those women who received TXA and they had a very slightly higher rate of VTE in the long term, mm -hmm. but that we don't know anything about why they got TXA and it probably mm -hmm. they were getting it because they were on anticoagulants because they had a high risk mm -hmm. of VTE. So not a helpful yeah. study and the risk was tiddly widdly anyway. So yeah. uh, I think the jurors out. So your data will be really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, thank you both very much. Uh, I'm going to move on now. It's uh, 1.30 and I'm going to ask Dr. Louise Newson to um, open up her video and she's going to talk to us uh, on an update on HRT and VTE risk. Now we are really lucky to have Louise in the UK because she she has done all the work that she has done off her own bat, uh, and she's really passionate about improving understanding of the menopause, access to HRT, uh, and the risks of uh, HRT. And she is the founder and a trustee for the menopause charity, and she's also set up a non-for-profit company, Louise uh, Health Research, sorry, Newson Health Research and Education, and she's worked closely with HIV charities to help women with HIV uh, 
who have the menopause to uh, get understanding of what's available. Uh, she's been director of the Primary Care Women's Health Forum and an editor for the British Journal of Family Medicine. And she has a website. I think she's going to tell us a little bit about that. So I'm going to stop talking. I could talk a lot about how wonderful she is, but she needs to talk. Louise, oh. over to you. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. No, it's lovely to listen to some compliments. But, um, let me share my screen and get on with some work. Um, so I'm hoping you can see that. Louise, are you able to increase your volume at all? Yeah, let me try. Thank you. So can you hear that better? Yes. Okay, so if, if my voice goes, then just let me know, please interrupt. So I'm just going to talk about um, HRT and the menopause and VTE risk. So just before I start, um, just for my declarations, I don't have any financial disclosures. I don't do any paid work with any pharmaceutical companies. Um, I am a director of a private menopause clinic. It's actually the largest menopause clinic in the world, which I set up just over three years ago. I only wanted to work um, one day a week doing some menopause work. I wanted to set up an NHS clinic, but there were no resources, there still aren't. Um, but we now see over 4,000 women a month through the clinic. I have 80 clinicians that work with me who are mainly NHS GPs and doing some work part-time with me. But we have a waiting list of um, over 8,000, and that was before the Davina documentary. I don't even want to know what it is now. And these are women from all backgrounds just wanting their own hormones back. So I know I can't reach the 11 million women who are menopausal in the UK, um, let alone the 1.2 billion menopausal women in the world. So as Beverly said, I've set up a not-for-profit company trying to do some research. It's very hard because women's health is neglected, especially menopause research, but um, we're making some progress. Um, I've also founded a, an app so women can be empowered with evidence-based information. Um, and as Beverly said, I'm the founder of the menopause charity as well. I work as an NHS advisor for the National Menopause Programme and I'm very honoured to be on the uh, UK Government's Menopause Task Force. I do have one declaration though in that I take HRT and I would not be working without it because my brain had completely gone. Um, so I, I also know how hard it is to get HRT because I couldn't get it prescribed from my, um, from my own GP. So I really wanted to just focus on a patient actually, just to focus our mind and think about real clinical practice. So this is a lady, different picture of course, a 51 year old lady who just generally felt dreadful. She was more tired, had less energy, <clears throat> worsening migraines. She'd suffered from migraines with aura for a while, but they'd become worse. Um, often just before her periods, um, her migraines were triggered and she was seen in a local migraine clinic and given a cocktail of different prophylactic drugs, including some really quite nasty drugs, as you would agree, progabalin, topiramate, gabapentin, and they all led to side effects. So she was struggling. She also had had recurrent UTIs, a lot of urinary symptoms and mild incontinence, which clearly was embarrassing her. She had some palpitations and also this worried her because she had a family history of um, cardiovascular disease and also stroke. She herself had experienced a DVT after a long flight from Australia five years ago and she had a family history of VTE so she was actually investigated and known to have factor V Leiden deficiency. So looking at her notes, she'd had a plethora of investigations in the secondary care from various specialists to try and work out what was going on with her. She'd seen a cardiologist, a neurologist and a urologist, and she was just reassured because everything was normal. All her investigations were normal, so no, invest no underlying cause was found. But that wasn't reassuring for her because she was having real symptoms affecting the quality of her life. So obviously she came to a menopause clinic, so I'm clearly going to ask her some more questions. And one of them would be, when was your last period? At 51, the average age of the menopause, obviously I will be thinking about that. And she quite clearly tells me her last menstrual period 13 months ago, that makes her menopausal. I also asked her if she was having any symptoms more specific for the menopause. Indeed, yes, she was having hot flushes around eight a day. Her sleep was poor, but she was often waking up drenched in sweat. 
I'm very direct, I suppose, with my questioning and uh, asked about vaginal dryness and irritation, thinking about her urinary symptoms. And she did have a lot. She was saying sitting down for long periods of time was quite uncomfortable for her. And she was experiencing postcoital UTIs, although she admitted she wasn't having much sex because it was so incredibly painful. Her last smear was very uncomfortable, so she decided she wasn't going to go for any more cervical screening. And as I've said, her libido was actually very low indeed. So hopefully the clinicians amongst you will be able to work out the diagnosis. In fact, I've already told you, she's a menopausal lady experiencing very classic menopausal symptoms. And we see people like this all the time in my clinic and no one has asked the question. No one's thought about their hormones. So it's obviously wasting a lot of time for women, but a lot of resources on the NHS as well. So the big question is, can she be prescribed HRT? And uh, I will come back to that at the end. So if we think about the menopause, there's obviously a lot of talk about it in the media, and which is great, actually, but there's still a huge amount of misunderstanding. People still think it's a transition that we just go through. But actually, we need to think about how long we're living for. The average age of the menopause is 51. We live for around 30 years of postmenopausal. So if we don't take HRT, that means we have low hormone levels for 30 years, whether we have symptoms or not, around a third of our lives. And certainly there are, there are um, health risks of not having our hormones. So it needs to be thought of actually as a female hormone deficiency syndrome with health risks. Um, we know that there are many health risks. So cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, type two diabetes, obesity, early dementia, clinical depression, even earlier death. It's very doom and gloom to be a menopausal woman. And in fact, there's um, some really key articles that have just come out in The Lancet uh, today talking about the cardiometabolic effects of low hormones. We have to realize this and we have to realize that most women die from heart disease and dementia and we have a treatment that can reduce the risk of these. So for me as a physician, menopause should be an opportunity because if I can get into these women, offer them the right treatment, actually I'm preventing um, disease and improving their future health. For me, it's also really important to be enabling and empowering our patients to have the right information. And um, I did initially develop a website called Menopause Doctor. It's now Balance Menopause um, or balance-menopause.com. And we have over two and a half thousand um, articles, podcasts, booklets, fact sheets on it. We've, we're starting to do some translations. So we've got some in Hindi, Punjabi, Spanish and French. Um, and we're trying to do more. We're very limited because we've got no resources for any of this. But it's reaching lots of women. And um, the Balance app is reaching around 600,000 women in 180 countries. So people are realizing what's going on with their bodies. In the clinic, we use a symptom questionnaire, um, and that's a really good way of focusing the mind and thinking about symptoms that might be affecting women. And with the app, they can monitor their symptoms and spot any patterns. So all the clinical work I do is out of the guidelines. We've only got one nice guidance that came out six years ago. Um, but sadly, it's not really been adhered to in many places, but the International Menopause Society and the estuary guidance that came out for uh, younger women. So just to summarise, they're about individualised care. Women need to be informed about the benefits and any risks so they can make appropriate treatment choices. And we know that for the majority of women, the benefits of HRT outweigh any risks. And there's no maximum length of time because we're replacing hormones. They can be replaced forever. Clearly, it's not just about taking HRT. Lifestyle is very important um, and people need a very holistic approach. Despite these guidelines, despite the evidence, only the minority of women take HRT. In the UK, we're actually the best, but we're still only around 14%. So despite the shortage, we've gone up over the last um, two years, we've gone from 12% to 14%. So I don't know quite what the government's going to do and it goes up even more than that. So clearly there are benefits, it improves symptoms because we're treating the underlying condition. But more importantly for me as a physician, we know we're reducing risk of all these diseases. 
estradiol is an immune modulator, so we know it actually reduces uh, COVID severity and mortality. And there's another study that came out from an Austrian group, yes, uh, just recently over the last month, showing again how women who take HRT have protection and less likely to die from COVID. And it's not just COVID, other infections such as Ebola and hepatitis, we know how important estrogen is for our immune system. And then if you think about inflammation, this accelerated aging that occurs, leading to all these conditions listed here. So there's no surprise that replacing the estrogen reduces all this risk. So what about for this lady? If I'm going to try and prescribe her HRT based on the available evidence and based on the guidelines, then this is my chance to really improve her future health. She's got an increased risk of cardiovascular disease from her, um, from her past history, and she's also got an increased risk of other diseases without her hormones. So I look in the BNF to see, well, how can I prescribe it? There's loads of warnings, loads of contraindications. The ones relevant for this talk show that actually a contraindication is a, a history of throm uh, well, arterial thromboembolic disease or history of VTE. It doesn't really say whether it's provoked or unprovoked. So if I didn't know anything about the menopause or hadn't read any literature, of course I wouldn't be prescribing it for her. She tells me that sitting down is very uncomfortable because of her vaginal dryness. She's at risk of urosepsis because she's had recurrent UTIs. We know vaginal dryness is very common in women who are menopausal. So if I try and just think, well, I'll just prescribe some vaginal hormones. Well, I could have a look at, in the BNF online. And this shows that a contraindication for vaginal hormonal treatment is venous thromboembolism. So a bit, bit worried here, aren't we? So what should we do? Let's look at the evidence. Certainly as a busy GP, I would not have the luxury of having time to look it up. We know, and we've already heard very eloquently, that the risk of um, thromboembolism in women and in men, of course, increases with age. We know there are various risk factors which we've already heard about. Um, so what about when we add HRT? Is it safe? We know we shouldn't be using the oral contraceptive pill, but what about HRT? Well, it's not dual tablets. We know that oral estrogen in HRT does have a risk of VTE. She usually quoted at around double. So a double of a low risk is still quite low and it seems to be highest the first year of taking it. But actually, if you've got an alternative without a risk, wouldn't that be better? So we have transdermal estrogen that doesn't increase the risk of clot and vaginal hormones actually don't have any systemic um, absorption. That's why women who've had breast cancer can still quite safely usually use vaginal hormones. So they have no VTE risk at all. So if we compare oral with transdermal, how does this happen? Well, obviously when you have oral estrogen, it increases concentration of estrogen in the liver and the liver, as we know, has lots of functions, but there's an impaired protein synthesis which makes a, a sort of more hypercoagulable state. Antithrombin levels reduce and there is an activation of the coagulation cascade. And there's also some resistance to activated protein C. Even a lower dose of estrogen, because the, in HRT, the doses of hormones are a lot lower than the contraceptive pill, but we know that even a low dose of oral estrogen has this effect. So if someone has got an increased VTE risk anyway, this double risk is probably going to be a lot higher magnitude. So we would certainly avoid, and the BNF is right for oral estrogen, it would be a, a relative contraindication. So if we look at the Women's Health Initiative, Women's Health Initiative study, um, which actually has been the biggest car crash for women's health in the history of women, which came out 20 years ago, and as you know, showed this supposed increased risk of breast cancer, but it wasn't reported properly. Estrogen only, estrogens associated with a lower risk of breast cancer from this study. But if we concentrate just on clot, there's two things which I think are very interesting here. Firstly, the risk of estrogen only, and this was oral estrogen, the relative uh, risk was 1.3. So it was, was increased, but it wasn't double. But then if you add in the progestogen, so they used a synthetic oral progestogen, and um, then the risk then was double. And if you look at the older women um, who were using combination oral estrogen with a synthetic progestogen, then their risk was a lot higher. And hence, this is one of the reasons that I would certainly not usually start someone on one of these preparations if they were going to certainly continue it in the long line.
There have been other studies. This study was a case control study, and you'll see that. Um, and again, I think this is very interesting. So no um, MHT, which is menopausal hormonal treatment, same as HRT. Obviously, the odds ratio was bang on the line. Oral increase, as we expect. But transdermal was actually slightly lower. And the more I think and learn about how estradiol works, I think it's probably anti-thrombotic, which would freak out a lot of people. But wouldn't it be nice to have some more studies to show that women using transdermal estradiol have a lower VT risk? So this is a study that um, is quoted mainly really, and this was an important study that came out a couple of years or so ago now in the BMJ. And this was um, looking at UK primary care research databases from CPRD. They did adjust for co-founding factors and there were over 80,000 women aged between 40 and 79 who developed clots. And they looked at their HRT habits and those who took HRT tablets were associated with a higher risk. So around nine extra cases per 10,000 women per year. So if you look at the data and how, when they tease out the differences, no surprise really, which reinforces what we thought already, that transdermal HRT, estrogen, there isn't an increased risk. Um, and then the combination is interesting because the combination transdermal is actually with a synthetic progestogen. So you'll see the middle, middle column, the 1.23. I'm not very concerned about that because I'm synthetic progestogens have their own risk as well. But certainly transdermal estradiol on its own is very reassuring that it's, it's either no risk or actually the middle column 0.87. Maybe there is this lower risk and certainly I really feel Strongly, this needs to be explored more. So the conclusions were certainly very reassuring. And um, the day after this study, the headlines were all about uh, HRT causes clot. They didn't say there are different types. They didn't say transdermal wasn't um, associated with the clot. So more sort of nail in the coffin for women trying to take HRT. So we look at the risk and we can very clearly see that Transdermal preparations aren't associated. Common sense medicine will tell us that it isn't, but also some of the evidence is showing that as well. And um, there's not been great studies, but the work that has been done in those with a really increased risk, we know that taking oral estrogen will increase the risk by about 25 fold rather than twofold. But with transdermal, there isn't an increased risk. So this is a paper I wrote a few years ago for the British Journal of General Practice, just reviewing how important transdermal estradiol and the natural micronized progesterone are for HRT. They're very different to older types of HRT. We can't compare apples and pears, and it's the same with HRT. But it's not just estrogen we need to look at. We need to look at progesterone as well. And this micronized progesterone is what's called body identical. It's the same structure as the hormone we produce ourselves. There are lots of synthetic progestogens, as you know, and they have different effects on different receptors. Digestogen probably has the lowest VT risk out of all of them. And medroxyprogesterone acetate MPA was the one used in the WIHI study. But we know that there is a risk of VTE of around 50% in women using estrogen with progestogens, which again was echoed in the WHI study, compared to estrogen only use. So we, we always worry, don't we, about estrogen, estrogen, but actually we need to think about progestogens. And, um, you know, even the progesterone only pill should be the progestogen only pill because it's a synthetic progestogen. And obviously the risk does depend. But certainly using micronized progesterone, which is derived from the wild um, yam plants, the same as the uh, natural body identical transdermal estradiol, it's micronized to make a very small particle size in an oily excipient so it can be absorbed easily in the body. So it's the exact duplicate of the progesterone we produce. Um, so chemically and um, the, the way it's configured is exactly the same. So therefore women have less side effects, it's better tolerated, but also we need to think the metabolic and biological effects of uh, micronized 
progesterone are very, very different to the synthetic progestogens. And this is important when we think about cardiovascular risk, but also we, when we think about, um, we, when we think about, sorry, when we think about um, thromboembolic risk, it's important. But when we think about cardiovascular risk, some of the narrative about HRT causing heart disease isn't the estrogen actually, it's the, it's the progestogens. So we know that the synthetic progestogens can increase clot risk, they can increase cardiovascular risk, they can have a negative effect on blood pressure, so they can increase blood pressure as well. And any breast cancer risk has been associated with the synthetic progestogens. It's never been associated with with um, the natural body identical progesterone, and I've already said, estrogen only is actually associated with around a 22% lower risk of breast cancer. So it's the synthetic progesterones, which are not very nice. So natural progesterone, again, very reassuring, especially with a VTE, which is relevant today. Frustratingly, it's not on every CCG formulary. And if any of you had watched the program with Davina, it's, it's not widely available in Scotland either. I just wanted to spend a few minutes on uh, GSM. So um, it used to be vulvovaginal atrophy. If you look up the term atrophy, it means withering or wasting away, which none of us really want to do. So quite rightly, it's been termed GSM, genitourinary syndrome of the menopause. And it's due to the low hormones, estrogen, but also testosterone in the vulva, vagina and surrounding tissues. And actually studies have shown it affects around 80% of women, yet only around 7% receive treatment. Um, and it can be really horrendous. I've seen women who have been suicidal because the pain and discomfort they've had night and day has just been a torment for them. Um, it doesn't just cause symptoms in the vagina and vulva, of course, it can cause urinary symptoms as well. And unlike menopausal symptoms, so vasomotor symptoms might go with time, Symptoms related to GSM are progressive over time. And so this is why it's really important that women are given treatment. And um, we've written a consensus um, statement for the management of GSM um, with the British Society of Sexual Medicine. And there are lots of treatment options. So it's great women can have a choice. Um, so there are vaginal uh, tablets. There's a vaginal ring that can be used for three months. There is also pessaries, there's gel, there's cream. Um, and then we've also got vaginal DHEA, which converts to estrogen and testosterone in the vagina. It's a daily pessary. But all of these have the same contraindications as I showed at the beginning, but they don't get absorbed. So how can they affect clot risk? I really don't know. Um, through the society, um, there's an easy HRT prescribing guide, which um, is evidence-based and it will show any preparations and how to prescribe them and the dose equivalents for those people who were struggling to get HRT gel due to the shortage. Again, there's some, some more patient information, but I've, we've written them specifically with clots, uh, about clots as the one on the left. We've also used um, this, the same insert for Thrombosis UK. We've just changed the sort of branding, but it's the only information booklet that I've written that has evidence in it. So we've referenced to it and Beverly's kindly reviewed it because I see so many women in my clinic who are just outright refused clots and um, I've done a podcast recently with someone called Maggie Honey, who very eloquently described her real battle to um, have HRT and how it's transformed her um, life, but actually it's improved some of her horrendous clotting history as well. So just before I finish, I want to go back to Claire. Um, I, I, clearly she came to see me and clearly I wasn't worried about the contraindications of HRT uh, described by the MHRA. So I gave her transdermal estrogen. I also gave her continuous preparation of progesterone because as you remember, she'd been amenorrheic for 13 months. I'd also gave her vaginal preparations because her symptoms were so extreme. Um, and then when I reviewed her, she was still having some symptoms of reduced energy concentration and low libido. So then I gave her some testosterone, transdermal, again, no clot risk with that. Six months later, she was much better. She felt amazing, the best she'd felt for a long time. And also her migraines had improved. And um, quotes like this, we hear a lot in the clinic. It's actually the most rewarding and transformational medicine that I've ever done. It's just frustrating that not enough people can access it. So finally, just for ending, just some take home messages. So women should all be allowed to have individualized care. We know that menopause can lead to very many different symptoms and also the perimenopause, of course. 
but it's really important to think about the health risks and whether a woman has symptoms or not and we need to be thinking about why is a woman not on HRT rather than should we be giving it because there are so many benefits of taking it and I hope this short presentation has reassured you that actually a lot of types of HRT women can still have even if they've got a history of BTE body identical types are preferable and evidence-based information is crucial and hopefully if we can do some more research in this area we'll have even more to reassure women. Um, there is a free uh, confidence in the menopause course that we've done through my not-for-profit with videos of um, actresses um, and a lot of lectures as well with lots of resources so that's available for anyone to access. So thank you very much and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, Louise. That was just a tour de force. Uh, and you have said so clearly that uh, transdermal HRT doesn't increase the risk of VTE. And it's a fact that needs to be known globally, but uh, we have a lot of work to do. There's just one question that uh, I would like you to answer before we move on a little bit late. It says, before starting any HRT, would you exclude or investigate for other causes for the symptoms? It's a great question. And again, it really does depend. Obviously, every symptom can be due to something else. And we've had this debate with NHS England because they've decided to take palpitations off as a symptom because it could be due to an underlying heart defect. And then when I said to them, well, brain fog and headaches could be a brain tumour, they got a bit freaked about that. But, you know, as clinicians, we should be able to work out a bit. And sometimes we don't. But I'll often say to people, I'll give you HRT for three months because it's safe. And then let's see what symptoms are left. And then if they've still got their headaches or brain fogs, of course, then I would go and investigate with an MRI scan. Often what happens, people are over investigated before. The other thing is to ask women. Women, actually, if they've given information and given a questionnaire, they'll actually say, look, I think this isn't related to my hormones. So, um, you know, we've got to just use our clinical acumen, really. So that's a very pragmatic approach. It's a good history exam and then a trial if you're happy that there's no yeah, sinister and not, not a blood test, FSH te blood test. I know they're recommended in women under the age of 40, but I've seen too many women who've had normal blood tests and they've had very florid symptoms improve with HRT. We know 9.2 million pounds a year is wasted on inappropriate FSH levels. If I had that sort of money, I would be opening a lot more menopause clinics. So, yeah, we don't need to do that. OK, that's very clear. Thank you very much. Um, please, would you join us at the end for the panel discussion? So, um, uh, the, I'd like to move on now to our last speaker. Uh, last but definitely not least, we have Professor Saskia Middledorp, and she's going to talk about gender transition and VTE risk. Now, uh, Saskia is a force to be reckoned with in the world of VTE. I, she's been on all the committees. She is a very powerful lady in campaigning and improving care. Uh, she has a new post at the moment. She's currently head of Department of Internal Medicine uh, at Radbourne University in the Netherlands. Uh, her interest in women and uh, hormones and gender and thrombosis started when she did her PhD, looking at the impact of hereditary thrombophilia uh, and the influence of oral contraceptives of blood coagulation and thrombosis risk. Uh, she specializes in vascular medicine and her focus has always been on women. Uh, and so Saskia, it's been a real delight knowing you're out there and that you're producing all this wonderful research and we're thrilled to have you today. Thank you very much for speaking. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hunt Beverly, for this uh, lovely introduction. And it's really a pleasure. And indeed, um, I do focus a lot of my research on women, but I do like men as well. And I think the red, uh, um, let's say the it's a lot of women, but my passion also is for, let's say, underserved groups. Uh, that includes young men with clots as well. Um, Today, I was asked to talk about gender transitions and VTE risk. And as a matter of fact, today, one of my colleagues is having her inaugural speech about transgender medicine here in Nijmegen in the, at the Rotboud University in just an hour. So it's a very timely matter. 
let me see. I do have some disclosures, but I don't think any of those are relevant for this talk. And all the money that I raise goes to my university and I try to do academic research with that. So some terms and hormone regimens I'm going to discuss briefly with you because I'm aware that not everyone is entirely uh, comfortable or not knowledgeable about uh, how to speak about gender and transition. And then I'm going to uh, introduce you to a patient of mine um, that has basically uh, opened my eyes more than they were already at that time. I'm going to speak about the thrombosis risks and of course I'm going to end with the art of medicine, personalized medicine. So when I prepared this slide, I, the title was, what are we talking about? And then I figured that is really weird. I'm not a native speaker, but we should say, whom are we talking about? And this is just some nomenclature. And of course we are, we are assuming that everyone has a gender identity that is binary, but that is not the case. But just for, let's say the sake of, of this tool where we're speaking of going from one gender identity or one gender to the other, uh, I'm just pretending as if it is always binary. So the gender assigned at birth is either male or female, and I'm assuming that you have either a female or a male gender identity in order to go to a transition. And the transgender term for a male going to a female, so male to female, which is easy, is either transgender woman or trans woman. And it's the other way around for females or women going to a male gender identity, female to male, or transgender man or trans man. And then clearly the non-transgender term, if you want to make it explicit, would have cis in front of it or non-transgender. I think cis is something that I use. And the pronouns are uh, compatible with the gender identity. So very briefly, I'm not an endocrinologist and we've heard beautiful talk uh, about HRT, so I'm not going into all the details, but these are the, uh, I have two slides on hormone regimens, just to have a basic idea. And first of all, male to female uh, transition involves estrogens, and those are mostly estradiol, and they are used for feminization in, in all sorts of organs, breast growth, reduction in facial and body hair, softening of the skin, and a change in body compositions towards the female uh, composition. And the route of administration can be oral or transdermal. Then anti-androgens anti are needed to suppress testosterone into the female range, and also those can be given orally or parenterally. And then very often progesterone is used for the alleged enhancement of breast development in oral form, although I have understood from the uh, endocrinologist that this is not let's say evidence-based proven, but it's very often um, uh, used for transitioning. If we go from female to male, then testosterone obviously is needed to have a masculinization effect with a male pattern of hair growth, muscle development, and cessation of uterine bleeding. And that can be uh, given transdermally or parenterally. And progesterone is used to additionally suppress uterine bleeds and also again oral or parenteral. Now I've given you the effects for the uh, gender transitions and but the overall overarching effect of all these hormone regimens is that they improve quality of life to a there's no doubt about it. If you have a gender dysphoria and you want to transition, then clearly using hormones that give your, you the gender that belongs to your gender identity definitely improve quality of life. And I think this is something that we should really keep in mind. It sounds very, very obviously obvious, but people uh, who are transgender very often uh, experience questioning of the uh, use of hormones. And I will give you an example with my patient. So here comes my patient, a transgender woman. When I met her, she was 56 years of age and she had started hormonal transition three years before. So she had basically raised a family as a man uh, had felt depressed for many years, was crumpy, 
and she saw a, uh, a documentary about transgenders and all of a sudden realized that this was the problem. Very, um, I think a very uh, intense uh, story also if you speak about this and it's 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 extremely interesting I think if you if you are I know many people are still a little bit skeptical which I always I always invite those people please speak to transgender people and ask about their experiences and try to imagine that in my case I would all of a sudden have a penis I mean that would all be a real real shock and I would not feel very comfortable Anyhow, this woman at age 56, so three years after starting hormonal transition, she had a segmental PE and a DVT, and this followed facial feminization surgery and concomitant immobilization due to knee trauma. In this case, uh, that is m really my patient. Uh, we also described in a review article published uh, a couple of years ago together, together with uh, Dr. Jean Connors. So... My patient was treated elsewhere routinely with anticoagulants and the proposed treatment duration was three months. The concomitant firm advice was to discontinue estrogens and the progesterone. And when my patient was hesitant about this and basically started feeling very um, upset about this advice, was told that she was playing with her life if she continued. She felt, extreme she felt extreme lonely, not being understood. It made her depressed and she actually did a suicide attempt. She still has, has her uh, lovely uh, um, spouse. And uh, after some Googling, she sent me an email whether or not I would be, be able to speak to her about this advice and whether there would be a different solution. So we have spoken about HRT and thrombosis, and um, I'm just going to give you uh, two slides of thrombosis and hormone, hormones for, with data from the non-transgender populations. And this is a, uh, uh, just a summary slide of the combined oral contraceptive pills, not HRT, and those are increase the risk three to seven fold, and the magnitude of the risk depend on the type. And clearly, of course, every magnitude of risk increase depends on the absolute baseline risk. And we have heard lots of this before from non-transgender population. It is, uh, well, this was my slide that I prepared yesterday. Oral, oral hormone replacement therapy increases risk by two, two to three fold, but it may be a little bit less, I've just learned. And again, the magnitude of the risk depends on type and mode of administration and transdermal HRT is safe to use. So let us now look at the data we have from transgender populations. If we look at 2,500 women from a Dutch cohort study going from male to female, then the risk of uh, acute cardiovascular events, including VTE, but also stroke and myocardial infarction was uh, estimated using cis women as a reference or using cis men as a reference. And this is very normal in transgender literature. But the, the message uh, is more or less the same for VTE. There is an approximately five-fold increase, regardless of what reference you use, to have VTE in, uh, in, in trans women. But I think also importantly, because this is also, also caused by thrombosis, stroke and myocardial infarction in, uh, in trans women is uh, increased by approximately 2.5 fold if you use cis women as a reference. Whereas if you use cis men as a reference, there is either no effect or a much more modest effect. If you go the other way around, female to male, uh, the figures are interesting. So if you go from female to male, then regardless of the uh, reference, the risk of VTE decreases compared to cis women or cis men. The risk of stroke increases. And interesting, look at these. I mean, you can see some wide confidence intervals, but the risk of myocardial infarctions in trans men increases if you compare them to cis women and is similar if, as if you compare them to cis men. Now, these are Dutch data, and very similar data come from the US. These are uh, data with a large 
uh, matched uh, control cohort, one to 10. And this slide basically shows you a cumulative incidence of VTE, either in trans, trans women, either uh, with reference SM for uh, reference, uh, sorry, cis men as the reference or cis women as the reference. And you can see that the similar ballpark of risk increase, and this is not a relative risk, but this is an absolute risk difference per a thousand patient years after eight years of follow-up. So that is approximately 1.7% uh, uh, risk difference or 1.4% risk difference in absolute terms after eight years of follow-up. And uh, a recent study uh, performed in Amsterdam and Leiden by uh, my uh, co-worker Luc Scheres and his team showed that if you look at, uh, let's say, underlying biology, I'm just showing you one slide here, that procoagulant changes, and what you can see here in red are factors that increase and basically uh, represent a procoagulant change, whereas the green dots represent an anticoagulant change that for trans uh, women, there's, there is an overall picture of, uh, of procoagulant changes, whereas in trans men, it seems to be more balanced. Now, personalized medicine, I think, is the beauty of our, of our, uh, of our job. And it's a privilege to work with people who are not protocolized themselves or who do not fit into protocols. At least that is my true conviction. And we were invited to write a short piece based on our uh, review article, again, with Dr. Jean Connors from Boston and myself in, uh, in uh, the Lancet Hematology. And it's very short, uh, but I think it was very nice that we were able to express our thoughts and our experiences here. So back to my patient. So really, stopping gender-affirming hormone th treatment is not an option. I think, of course, I wasn't in that, in that consultant room with that colleague who said that she was playing with her life. But if I would have been, I would have jumped in between. I, and I, I, I mean, I'm just, if at least that is how my patient perceived it, told me, and I, 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 I'm inclined to think that that's actually what has been said. And we do know also from other non-transgender research that people say pretty stupid things to our patients in general, if it comes to VTE. Anyway, uh, stopping is not an option. However, the risk of recurrent VTE with continuation of hormones, I think is too high to discontinue anticoagulant treatment. So, this is not very difficult. I mean, speaking to your patients, listening to your patients, and then coming up with a personalized uh, approach where you have an informed decision and an informed patient is just very normal. So after careful counseling, we decided to continue anticoagulation. Initially, we used full dose DOAX and extended dose DOAX after a couple of months. Whether you can use extended DOAC doses uh, is, is, I think, a matter of debate, uh, potentially because uh, of many reasons. And, and, but there are some reassuring data also from the Einstein extension studies that have been published not so long ago, that also with a lower dose DOACs, you can concomitantly use, for instance, oral contraceptives. And I would like to uh, extrapolate that to transgender hormone regimens. There are, of course, other vascular health issues to consider. And I did show you the data on, on MI and on stroke. So I think it's really important to realize that our transgender patients are, um, both trans men and trans women are at risk also for arterial uh, risk factors, sorry, arterial uh, um, thrombosis. So we should assess smoking, obesity, uh, we should assess the personal and family history of VT, a lipid profile, diabetes, and hypertension. We, we don't have to be experts to do that. I think GPs can do that as well, but I think this should be part of integral transgender care. So with that, I would like to conclude that gender-affirming hormone therapy is an integral part of someone's being. And I would like to propose that it's like DNA almost, that is very difficult to change. And we should accept that and we should respect that. 
Gender affirming hormone treatment does increase, however, cardiovascular risk, VTE in trans women and arterial thrombosis in trans men. And with that, I would like to conclude and I'm really happy to take any questions. I think I was a bit short, but that's good. No, but you said everything. You covered it all and you've covered it with such sensitivity that uh, I think we all really appreciate that. So thank you for your wonderful message uh, and you have made it very clear. Uh, I'm just looking to see if there are any questions specific to you and there aren't. So I'm going to invite all of the panel members back uh, for us to have a, a general discussion. Uh, and I do have one question here, which really can go to anybody. It says, how long does the HRT risk, uh, how long is the HRT risk maintained after starting uh, oral HRT? I'm taking to read it. If a DVT happened after six months, you would attribute that to the HRT. But what about if the DVT happened after 10 years? Would you say the same is the DV is the HRT is a risk factor and also saying thank you for all the excellent presentations. So who would like to take that? Can I do that? Yes, please. I have very strong feelings about this because this is an ongoing uh, debate or, 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 or issue. So it's an excellent question. It is not only with HRT, but also with oral contraceptives. And I think in, let's say in cisgender, uh, so non-transgender population, there certainly is a starter's effect, meaning that the relative risk is increased in the first six to 12 months. And I think at that time, point in time, your most vulnerable patients, so most vulnerable to VTE, probably pop up. But if you look at the epidemiology over time, there remains, the risk remains incre increase. And, and, and I'm very confident about this for oral contraceptives. But I, I think it, it goes down for HRT as well. But of course, that, that bandwidth is a bit smaller. That's my take. However, and that is why I would like to take this question. So, so to, to wrap this up, I consider it associated with whether it's 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. And I think there's just a bucket full of risk factors and age and all those things. But if you look at transgenders and you look at VTE, you, I did show you that Kaplan-Meier curve where you can see that that risk is, increase is very, very, I mean, this is absolute risk is a bit different, but it, it remains going up, up, up. It's not like a slope going like that. So I think that's intriguing. And I don't have an, uh, have an answer. But for me, it's associated always. And I don't consider it differently from a starter. That's my approach. So, I, I mean, I have to agree with you. And we have to remember that the blood changes of uh, the combined oral concept of pill and HRT will persist. Uh, so the other way of thinking about it is, well, if you have a, a clot quite late on the pill or a oral HRT, then you, if you stop them, the patient will be less procoagulant. Uh, so that is another way in, in sort of helping manage that patient. And of course, there may be other risk factors there. Does anybody want to add to that? Fionella, Louise? So just, just, just to add, you know, if the women have got a risk of VTE, they'll have it whether they take HRT or not. So we see some people who've had clot many years ago, they might not have an inherited condition. And we have had patients who have clots on their on their transdermal HRT with natural micronized progesterone. But that's just what happens. It's a bit like women who have breast cancer taking HRT. You know, women who clean their teeth will have a clot or they'll have breast cancer. It's not, not cleaning the teeth that's caused it. And, and I think most patients know, realize that, you know, the biggest resistance is that um, women are just told, no and you know hearing the, the patient of the this person being told no they're dealing with their dabbling with their life you know we hear this every single day in my clinic we see a lot of suicidal women um who are just you know we told you can't have hrt and their lives are really on the edge and it's so distressing and i feel that this is where shared decision making comes in it's really important isn't it and the other thing i didn't add obviously is, is beverly's often said before there are people who are who are quite stable on oral hrt and they're using thromboprophylaxis as well so actually that that's fine too isn't it 
you know it is um fianola do you have anything to add um, no completely agree and but perhaps as as saskia pointed out you might think about additional risk factors or provoking factors if a woman has had an event after 10 years so we're not saying that there isn't an increased risk associated with the hormone itself but i suppose um we just need to be careful about additional provoking factors although it could simply be an, an age effect as well and um, it highlights the importance of of shared decision making doesn't it yes and so there's another question in the chat which is um, well, it's a difficult one, but, it, but it's deceptively simple. How did you reassure your patient about increased thrombotic risk? And we could take it more widely. How do you talk to patients who have increased thrombotic risk? Saskia, what do you think? Um, so I think you, I think it all starts with um, building trust. And building trust is the art of medicine. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's Friday afternoon, so I'm I won't, I won't speak too long. But I think really, I mean, if you are, if you are respectful to your patients and really listen to the story, and ask what your, what are the expectations, and what is it that the, that the patient is, is, is wanting from you or from your treatment, and it can be very different. So there's not one answer. So my patient was very worried that I would tell her that she, indeed she needed to stop her hormone, her gender affirming hormones. And she was not so afraid of bleeding. So when I told her, well, then we don't stop the anticoagulants, that was fine. There are also patients who are extremely afraid of bleeding or, or, or whatever, you know? So you have to first have that conversation. And I, so I think that's the, that's, that's the trust building. And of course, I, I always try to bring in evidence. Uh, of course, depends on your patient because some patients just want to say, "Tell me, doctor, what you what would you do?" Uh, and others want to know everything in, in detail. And I, whatever they need, I will try to. That's my way of trying to reassure it. And sometimes it takes a bit more time than the fifteen minutes we have, but it's uh, it's okay. That's how I do Absolutely. it. I I so agree with you, Louise. Do you want to add to that? You're uh, talking to women who are probably at their wits' end. Yeah, I think it's empowering women and it's the same as patients. And I strongly feel as a healthcare professional, I'm an advocate for, their, for them. I'm not there to tell them what they can and can't do. And I think the important thing is also is that they can change their mind with time as well. Because sometimes, you know, for me, I'm, I'm telling them things that maybe for the last 10 years, they've been told they're not allowed to have or they can't have. Um, and then often even when I do prescribe something, I get letters of complaint to say, you should not be doing this. This is outrageous. And so then the patients get lost. And then who do they go to? who do they trust and it's even harder because I'm running a private clinic so people think well she's just trying to make money out of this poor vulnerable patient but of course I'm not so you know there's all these things that go on it's it's quite political out there but actually it's it's allowing women to have the choice you know even if HRT caused a you know 50 times increased risk of clots but this person was suicidal or this person was worried about osteoporosis then of course they can choose it you know we're not going to be sued for every clot that happens and I hopefully you'll agree with that Beverly. Hopefully not. Uh, Fianola what's your view? Yeah look I, I couldn't agree more and um, I want to even take, take it further so even look back at you know reassuring patients after any any VT related um, event to begin with, and it I was as you were both speaking and saying such respectful, powerful things about um, how we listen to our patients. I was thinking about conversations I've had recently with Anne Marie O'Neill, who is the founder of Thrombosis Ireland, and also um, Leslie Lake, who is the chair of the National Blood Clot Alliance in the US, and. You know the, the ways that we can reassure and the kind of information that patients can take in i've learned from from these patients that that it varies over time and maybe you know in general this is something that as a community we can we can focus on sometimes it's more important than the medical care that we give and um, so like i really couldn't agree more with everything that's been said and just to pick up on what Saskia said about um, medicine is all about gaining trust. And uh, I mean, at medical school, we were told again and again, you must listen to your patient. 
the patient will tell you the answer. You're not listening enough if you don't hear the answer. So it, I think, and that uh, isn't a feature of uh, modern me medicine necessarily, although the doctors we're turning out seem to have those features, but it's so important with all this science that we have discussed and all this knowledge, at the end of the day, you treat your patient respectfully uh, and you give them time to talk. And I think it's, it's especially true for my practice. I see a lot of people who've come along and who are desperate like Louise and they want answers and people haven't given them time and giving time is a very precious thing uh, for a medic and very difficult in this current time when we're all very overworked, but, but it feels, very satisfying if you can make someone go away and you've dispelled uh, their anxieties and you've given them some fresh way of going forward. I didn't expect to be talking about this at this session. <laughs> but it's it's true, isn't it? And and hearing the three of you, you you all have that approach. It it, it is it is wonderful to hear. Um, I haven't got any more questions in the chat. I think that you have astounded them uh, all and you all give very clear presentations. Is there anything that one of you might want to say over and above? Well, maybe one thing. I think that the, the, the things we are experts in, like pregnancy related thrombosis, HRT, hormone related thrombosis, for, for, for us, it's not that complicated, is it? I mean, technically, it's not at all complicated. But apparently, it's complicated if you don't have your tech, your techni technicality right, and then it gets really messy. And I think the fact that you that you are that you are allowed. I mean, I feel very privileged that I'm in a position where I do a lot of internal medicine that's very broad. And when I don't know it, I can go to someone. And it's the other way around. I know a lot of this, and I so I can be the expert here. So you don't need your your brains to do that. All you can you can have your brains to to speak to patients. And I I find it very satisfying as well. And I think that for patients is a big relief if you tell them that for you that technical part is routine. It's how, how it matters to the patient that you have time for. Nice. Well, it looks like we're ending on a philosophical note. We've had a lot of science, we've had a lot of clarity, and then we've all realized that at the end of the day, it's all about communication with our patients. Um, and it's a humbling reminder, actually, that that's really what it's all about. Uh, and as medics, if we don't have the knowledge, we should be passing our patients on to someone who does. But hopefully, if people come to see us about our errors, we can help them. Okay, I'm going to draw it to a close. What a wonderful selection of human beings we have had speak. Uh, and thank you, all three of you. Look forward to seeing you all again 